Skyway and Sumya, and we represent DPS Tax Consulting. As a great economist once said, it's not just about how much money you make, it's about how much of it you keep and for how many generations you keep it. Nowhere is this more important than in tax planning. So we are here today to talk about Fast Speed Incorporated. Um, we have just been hired as tax analysts for the internal tax department for this company. And we are going to provide uh, information on the tax provision and tax strategy, as well as some recommendations for certain situations that have occurred over the past year and the company's plans going forward. So the first issue that we are going to address um, involves the corporate tax payable for the year 2020. Um, we're also going to do some calculations on the deferred tax balance that should be carried forward on the balance sheet for financial reporting, keeping in mind that this company is public and therefore follows IFRS. Our second issue is going to relate to the COVID-19 incentives and the various programs that have been made available, as well as how they relate to the changes in the company's operations over the past year as a result of the pandemic. And then finally, we are also going to address recommendations for the relocation of the um, current facility in Brassard to Montreal, the new building that has been built and the tax implications of different options for that building. So just to uh, reiterate the timeline, um, the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown started in March 13th of 2020. Um, there was the acquisition March 1st of 2020, and the company has a December 31st year end. Now, today we are at the end of January 2021. Um, any tax payments will have to be made by April 30th of this year, and June 30th is going to be the filing deadline for the corporate income tax. A few notes about the company. Um, the company, Fast Speed Incorporated, was based on Brassard on the south shore of Montreal. Uh, the company was founded 11 years ago and has more than 2,000 employees today. Um, they've seen exponential growth in the past year, which led senior management to decide to take the company public and file an IPO, which of course required the conversion of all accounting information to IFRS and public disclosures that go along with that. So getting into the corporate tax payable. Um, so of course we started with the company's um, income statement per books, the statement of financial performance. And of course there are a number of items that have to be adjusted to go from book income to taxable income. Um, briefly, there were a number of items that were listed that we did have to address. Of course, there's the bad debt provision. Um, in the past, the company based that on specific analysis of accounts uh, within 90 days. But in this case, they did a flat 10%. So we added back what would have been that 10% figure. Um, we could deduct actual write-offs. So if there were any specific debts that were written off last year, we could of course deduct those. Um, there, was a, there were some investments into um, evaluating the manufacturing process as the need for personal protective equipment grew last year. And the company estimates that we will be able to claim a uh, $360,000 research and development tax credit we're assuming that that was properly calculated. We'll go more into the criteria on that later. So um, we would have to add that back, but then deduct that based on the tax credit. Uh, the legal and warranty provisions that are on the balance sheet as liabilities, we would have to add those back for tax purposes and then deduct actual expenses when they incur. And then the pension plan contributions, uh, that was paid in cash. So that is deductible for tax purposes as cash basis. Um, so then there were also some financing fees related to a loan for acquisition of some new property. Uh, those financing fees were partially amortized for financial reporting purposes. However, for tax purposes, all of those need to be amortized over five years. There was one amount that was amortized partially. Uh, the other was expensed. So we're adding the full, full amount back and then amortizing those at 20%. Uh, there was the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy Grant um, that was received in the amount of 356000 and that was written off against the salaries which it was used to pay under cost of goods sold, so no adjustment is needed there. That was the correct treatment for tax purposes. There was also an issue with a bonus that was paid to a senior executive last year, um, or I'm sorry, in 2019, and that was conditional on the um, executive remaining employed with the company because he left. Um, that was not paid, but because the amount was considered immaterial, it was not adjusted on the books. That will need to be added back on the 2019 return because it would have been expensed in 2019 when it was declared. 
And uh, so we would have to file a small amendment to the T2 for that purpose. And that does affect the opening balance of the deferred tax liability account. Uh, there were some issues with gifts and entertainment, which we're gonna talk about in a few minutes. And then there was also um, some interest resulting from a tax audit. And that was deducted on the income statement. That's not a deductible expense for tax purposes. So we had to add that back. Now, getting into some of the employee um, benefits and uh, some of the gifts and meals and entertainment, um, of course, there's a difference between a taxable benefit provided to an employee that they would have to include in their income and then a tax deduction for the company or for the person. Uh, but we'll talk about the treatment from both sides of that. Um, in terms of the gift baskets, so normally we do a big Christmas party for all of our employees. This year we couldn't do the gathering, so we sent gift baskets to the employees. Uh, the total amount of that is um, $325,000 based on the number of employees. It was about 75%. Um, we're going to say, we're going to assume that the total amount per employee was less than $500 because these were non cash gifts. Um, that's going to come under the limit. Normally, we would have done the Christmas party, and the meals and entertainment for the Christmas party would have been 100% tax deductible in other years and would not be included in employees' taxable income because they're available to all employees and it's based on the party. But since we sent the gift baskets, um, the gift baskets are deductible up to, um, are deductible in the full amount for the company and do not have to be included in income for the employees if they're under $500 and not cash, which we believe is the case here. Now, the next issue is the luxury retreat. Um, normally you do a team building experience and go to a conference that is, um, has a work-related purpose, but because we couldn't do that this year, we sent everyone to this luxury retreat on the islands, including private jet transport. Uh, this is something that is not really for an employment purpose. It doesn't count as a deduction for conferences, so we did have to add that back as at the full amount, 100%. That's the $88,000. And then there's also the meals and entertainment um, relating to the local team arena to both reward employees and invite customers to entertain. Um, that amount is going to cover, is going to be covered under the 50% meals and entertainment, um, the uh, deductibility there. Um, so we are going to do the 50% meals and entertainment as an add back, as you'll see when we get to the schedule one. Now, in terms of the R&D credit, uh, the criteria to be able to claim that is that it has to be for technological advancement, technological uncertainty, and have technical content. And based on the information that we obtained about that um, R&D credit that the company is expecting to receive, we do meet that criteria based on the improvements to the manufacturing process and that it's relating to um, improving the process and ensuring fewer defects going forward. And it does involve a um, technical analysis. It's not just superficial. So that will be um, receivable as expected. So the end result of this, and uh, we have more detailed calculations in the appendix. I'll be happy to talk more in the Q&A about those if needed. Um, we start with the net income per books of 4,592,000. Um, we have some additions, we have some deductions. We, have, uh, we did purchase a large number of capital assets this year. And again, detailed calculations are in the appendix. Uh, but because of the amount of CCA that we're deducting, that's actually going to reduce the net income for tax purposes to a loss of 1.1 million. Um, the effective tax rate is 26.5%, but because that's a loss, it's nil tax payable, and there will be a loss that can be carried forward to future years. And in terms of the deferred tax balance, again, we have detailed calculations in the appendix. I'll be happy to talk more in the Q&A. Uh, but we started with a balance of 884,000. Of course, we made a small adjustment to that because of the bonus that we have to go back and amend from um, 2019. And then with all of the permanent or all of the temporary differences, we end up with an ending DTA uh, liability of 7.4 million. And we had permanent differences of 38,558. So with that being said, I'm gonna pass it off to my colleague who will talk about the COVID-19 impacts. Thank you, Phil. Now we all know COVID happened and it impacted a lot of company, included uh, the company right now we're talking about. And what happened here is that everyone has to work from home, right? And for that, uh, since the first lockdown, most of the support and administrative staff have been working from home. And here, that's a good thing from here is that employees are able to claim deduction for the home office supplies here. Deduction, as, we meant, as Phil mentioned, it's a reduction to the income, ta income tax liability to pay. 
and there are a few large eligibility to here. Uh, first of all, is that they, are, they have to be working from home in 2020 due to COVID-19 pandemic and the uh, employer is required them to work at home and also work more than 50% of the time at home for a period for four consecutive week or more. And then in order to get these eligibility, there's a sign to sign, there's a form to sign, sorry about that. There's the form T2200 uh, to sign it in order to be eligible to claim these deduction. So the first step would be here for your employees will be to sign, sign that form to be able to get that deduction. And then here there is with CRA, they implemented two methods. There's a temporary flat rate method and the detailed method. For the temporary flat rate method, the only eligibility here is that they need to be working home, uh, they need to be working during COVID. And for that, how they can claim is claim $2 each day. And for that, there's a maximum of $400 they can claim in total. And the detail method, it is, they have to be working through COVID. And also another requirement is working from home. And here, what is this is that they are about to claim the actual amount they paid or on the expenses on with the support document. And what are the expenses they're eligible to deduct? There's home space expenses, certain phone expense, and also office supplies. But however, they need to remember that um, home ho house mortgage cannot be used to pay for these expenses. And that is why since there's two methods to go with, since we know that your employees have been working from home, it is better to go with the detail method since they will allow to deduct their expenses. And then also another one, it is SUS. So we know that the company received $356,000 of wage subsidy and is recruited in return for wages included in the cost of growth. And as Phil mentioned, there was no error in it. You know, it was corrected properly. That is why here the grant is taxable. Another one that they're eligible for is the CERs. It's the business with the job of revenue are eligible for taxable rent subsidy. And it is maximum 65% times the 1.5% with the 40% up to 75% K per period. And then here also there's some criteria. So the criteria is that um, you had a CR business number on September 27, 2020, eligible for business, charity or nonprofit, experience in a job or revenue and have eligible expense in owning or renting building and used to earn income on it. And the grant here would be taxable. And then overall, we know that since um, this, is, this is a public company and it's been impacted highly by the COVID, they're allowed to also have government grants that are also available for them. And now I will pass it to Dai Wei who will talk about the building issue. Thank you, Sonia. You built a building in 2020 for a new office. And as we know, uh, this building cannot be used uh, during the year because of the pandemic. And what you decide will be happening in 2021st and will not impact what happened in your tax return in 2020. However, it will impact going forward. And the current situation is you have this building completed in October 2020. However, due to the pandemic, we cannot use it. And uh, we have a few options here. However, the important consideration is we want to reduce costs and we want to maintain the telecommunication uh, work from home after the pandemic. That's a potential choice. And according to our balance sheet, we have a 6.5 million current liability to be paid next year. However, we only have 1 million cash on hand uh, since, December, uh, since December 2020. And that means we need to at least 5.5 million to pay those uh, uh, outstanding current liabilities. And however, last year we took a lot of loans to cover that. And this year we need to suggest another solution. So here we have a few options. Option one is to sell the new building and keep the old building. And conveniently, we do have an offer on the table that is uh, giving a very attractive price. We will analyze that as well. Uh, option B is to rent out the new building and keep the old office. And to do that, because uh, it's a pandemic, so we will not be uh, expecting to rent 100% of the capacity. However, at 100% rent, we will receive a net present value of $300,000. And that will not be able to cover our 5.5 million liability to be paid. And the, option, the third option is to sell our old office and move to the new building as we planned in 2020. However, to do that, it will incur some more of the moving costs and, uh, that will, and uh, it will give us a return, after tax return of 5 million, 
we will, which is enough to pay. And we will talk about a little bit more on the option three as well. So for the option one, the new office was built with the intention of using. And if we sell the building this year, it will be a unique sell. And since we're not in the business of real estate, it will consider a capital gain and book true gain loss. And if we want to sell it, we will have an existing offer on the table. So it's, uh, it's no issue to sell it, uh, to find a buyer. And the proceed can be used to pay our outstanding liability. So I believe it's a very advantage for us to sell. However, the con is our plan to move to a new building will be delayed because we're selling this new office. Uh, now let's talk about option B. Option B will have a renting, uh, a uh, estimate renting of uh, $35,000 per month at 100% capacity. However, to achieve to that uh, revenue, we need to reduce the, uh, reduce the space and uh, to do additional modification to the existing building. And we do not have a cost for that. And also our plan for moving to the new office will be delayed. The pro is that this income stream will reduce our financial burden. However, with a total of $300,000 rent per year at next present value, we will not be able to cover all liabilities. For option three, we will be able to sell the old office and uh, move to the new office right now. However, we do not see a very, uh, a very useful use case because our employees are working from home and moving to a new office means we will have uh, incur moving costs in addition to those revenues. And the pro is we will still have a profit of 5.5 million. And however, the con is the moving costs will be uh, deducted and also the new building will be vacant until the end of pandemic, which is unsure since the pandemic is still uh, enduring. So we decide we go to the option one and uh, based on the offer, we see there is a capital gain of 1.6 million, well, 1 million on the building and 800,000 on the land. And our net uh, capital gain and the tax payable for both, we have a total tax payable of $300,000 with after tax proceed of $9.6 uh, $9 million. And those will be more than enough to pay off our current liability as well as reduce our burden on the debt payment to make sure we will cash the flow for the next year. And I will leave to Phil to conclude. Thank you, Daiwei. So stepping back, uh, the reason that we were here today was to provide the tax provision and tax strategies for Fast Speed Incorporated uh, regarding the situations that have happened over the past year. We looked at the corporate tax for uh, tax year 2020 and presented the reconciled um, income to uh, for tax purposes. We also provided calculations on the deferred tax liability and asset accounts. We looked at the impacts of COVID-19 and we have provided recommendations to the HR department regarding the incentive programs for employees as well as the work at home provisions. And we also provided a recommendation regarding the building. We looked at three different options and our recommendation is to sell the new building based on that offer and use the tax to pay the liabilities that we have coming due. So with that being said, I would like to thank you for your time and we will open the floor to any questions. Thank you very much, Team G. I'll just stop the recording before the uh, question period.